name we pray. Amen. All right, before the uh, children are dismissed. Okay, so kids, we're not dismissing you quite yet. Just give me just a quick minute. I want to show you all something here, uh, maybe something that will encourage you and uh, brighten your day here just a little bit. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, this little girl who's about to come out, her name is Rowan. Uh, we've been praying for her diligently. This is uh, her last day of chemo and uh, then celebrating this. And, um, and so just to kind of give you an update, and again, if you don't know, uh, Rowan doesn't come here. They, they don't even live in state, but they have a lot of connections to this church have grandparents who currently attend, grandparents, uh, another set of grandparents who used to attend but have since moved out there, um, and then their parents grew up in this, and then her parents grew up in this church, and so a lot of connections here with little Rowan. Uh, she has scans tomorrow uh, to find out how effective the chemo has been, and then is having a litany of tests on her heart, on her uh, good kidney, and her blood vessels, and so on. Uh, to see what the side effects from the chemo has been. Did I get all that right, Mike? Um, and so the results are coming back on Tuesday. The results are good. Her port will be taken out on Wednesday. So I'd like to, uh, just for us to take a moment here uh, to pray for Rowan. And then if you would remember to, over the next 36 hours, uh, to be praying diligently that the results from these tests will come back good. Um, that, that would just be much appreciated. Let's pray for Rowan here. Father, you are the God of all power and the God of all grace and the God of all comfort. Uh, even in the midst of such terrible trial to see uh, the faith and the strength of uh, Jordan and Hallie, of uh, Mark and Jill, of Mike and Rhonda, uh, Lord, has been a testimony to us of your faithfulness to them. We pray that you will strengthen Rowan, continue to, to build back her strength, after having endured uh, weeks and months of treatments for this cancer. Uh, we pray for the scans tomorrow. We pray that they will come back showing absolutely no cancer, that it will be completely gone. Uh, we pray that as the tests are done to see the, the side effects from uh, the chemo, uh, we, we pray that, that there will be zero long-lasting side effects. Uh, we pray that, that even a year from now, this will all be a distant memory uh, from the past for Rowan, and that she'll be able to, to resume life as a normal young child. We pray that whatever um, you and your hand bring to this family, that you will strengthen them and give them grace and courage for the days and weeks to come. We pray uh, for uh, Jordan and Hallie especially on a Tuesday. Uh, we pray that they will find their, their strength and their courage in you, and that they will find their hope in you. And we pray again that all of these tests will come back good. Pray this for the glory of your name. Amen. All right, kids, you are dismissed. A pre K through a second grade. You can go back with Miss Kayla back there at the back door for Children's Church. And for the rest of us, grab your Bibles and get to Matthew chapter 16. <clears throat> Matthew 16 is where we're going to camp out this morning, and uh, right from the get-go, I need a volunteer. I need uh, someone to help me out. I uh, went to an auction yesterday, and th that was one of those where we told the kids, don't raise your hands, okay? I, I, need, I need someone to raise their hand and be a volunteer here. All right. Uh, yeah, come on. Yeah, you. You. All right. Now, see, I knew it would be a kid and not an adult, because you adults are smarter than that. You know me well enough to know that you really don't want to be an illustration of one of Matt's sermons. All right, just hang on to that. Don't open it, okay? Don't open it yet. I'll tell you when to open it. So uh, yesterday, I was hungry for cookies, and uh, I had Charity uh, make me up some cookie dough. You know what? I'm not going to do that, or my hands are going to be greasy the whole sermon, all right? So uh, I had Charity make me some cookie dough, and normally she'll put, you know, like, uh, like a cup of chocolate chips in it or uh, a cup of M&Ms. I would prefer a cup of chocolate chips and M&Ms, but you don't always get what you want. Uh, but I told her to, to not put anything in it. Because I wanted to have something different in the cookies this week. I wanted to have something special and a special secret ingredient. So I went out into my yard. You can open that up now. Went out into my yard and I got that. Um, stuff that my dog had left behind as fertilizer for the yard. And I thought that I was going to put that in the cookies. Now, if I put that in the cookies and baked it, do you want me to take that? <laughs> if I put this in the cookies and baked it, would you eat my cookies? No. no. 
Man, what if, what if I just put like a half a cup of this in there? Would you eat my cookies? Yeah. No. A tablespoon? Yeah. A teaspoon? You're a very picky eater. I don't understand. Why wouldn't you eat my cookies? <laughs> You're right. That was a very good answer. Okay, you can go back and sit down. Thanks for your help. Now, the great reality is that there was nobody who would say, yeah, I would eat some of this. I would eat some of those cookies because that's absolutely disgusting, right? It's gross. Nobody in their right mind would eat these cookies because we recognize that just a little bit contaminates the whole thing. Jesus is using in our text today the illustration of leaven in bread, which is kind of like yeast in bread. He's used this illustration before, and he'll use it again. But I wanted for us to get a picture in our mind that's maybe a little bit more real to us. You see, most of, most of you, you don't make your own bread. And even when you do, you'll use something like yeast instead of leaven, which those are two kind of, you would make bread in two different ways. And so I wanted to use an illustration that we know. You all know how to make cookies. Most of you have animals, and we all know that just a little bit contaminates the whole thing. Jesus, in our text today, he is going to warn his disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And when he does that, he's telling us that he wants us to be alert and on guard against false teaching. Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 1. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came. And to test him, they asked him to show, him, show them a sign from heaven. And Jesus answered them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began discussing it among themselves, saying, oh, we brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, O oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive, do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The outline this morning is going to flow with our text. There are two conversations that take place. Uh, the first conversation is between Jesus and the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, we've seen the Pharisees quite a bit already through the Gospel of Matthew, and we will see them many more times. However, in, in New Testament times, the Sadducees basically outnumbered the Pharisees. There were a lot more Sadducees than Pharisees. And, and this is the first time that we see these Sadducees interacting with Jesus so let me fill you in a little bit on who these guys were. Uh, while they outnumbered the Pharisees, they were the religious liberals of the day. They denied the supernatural. They did not believe that God was sovereign over the course of the world. They did not believe in angels. They did not believe in a resurrection from the dead. So, so we're not talking about Jesus' resurrection from the dead. They didn't believe in any resurrection from the dead. They believed that when you die, you go in the ground, and that's all that there is. The Sadducees, uh, if you want a little mnemonic device to help you remember who the Sadducees are, the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. You have the Sadducees, the religious liberals, and you have the Pharisees, who are the legalistic fanatics. These two groups, they never get along. They're like, they're like the Democrats and the Republicans, where the only thing that they can agree on, the only thing that will ever get a unanimous vote in the Senate, is that daylight savings time is a scourge upon humanity. That's it. That's all that they can agree on. Same thing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. If you wanted to use a modern uh, religious uh, type of, of idea of what this would have been like, it would have been like a, on one side, you have an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, Bible-banging, foot-stopping, soul-winning, door-knocking, pew-jumping, devil-chasing, sin-hating, King James-only preacher on that side. It's a Mark Lowry quote. 
And then on the other side, you have Priest Susanna of the Hickory Nest Episcopalian Church in Southern California. You get these two people in a room together, <laughs> they won't even agree that the sky is blue. All right, They will agree about nothing. So that's the picture you should have in your mind. Pharisees and Sadducees, they never got along about anything except that they didn't like Jesus. In fact, both groups hated Jesus. So you have these religious enemies united against the Son of God. They come to Jesus and they request a sign. You have a sign requested. In verse 1, they, they test him, asking him to show them a sign from heaven. You know, this entire text is an adventure in missing the point. The Pharisees and Sadducees, they are asking for a sign from heaven when standing two feet in front of them is the Son sent from heaven. It would be like walking up to Michael Phelps and saying, you know, I really would like to meet an Olympic athlete someday. Hello! Same thing going on here. Show us a sign from heaven. <laughs> Hello! He is standing right in front of you. So you have a sign requested. Second, you have a rebuke given. Verse 2, he answered them, When it's evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning it will be stormy today. The sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you can't interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. Do you get the imagery here? Jesus is saying, hey, at sunrise and sunset, you can look up into the sky, play amateur meteorologist, and figure out what's going to happen, what the weather will be like. Yet, you do not have enough discernment to see what is happening right in front of your face. When Jesus says you can't interpret the signs of the times, he's not talking about things that were still future to them or things that were in the past. He's talking about the reality that they had been looking and longing and hoping for the Messiah to come. And the Messiah was standing right there. And they were missing him. However, I do not want to land too hard on the heads of the Pharisees and Sadducees without the recognition that we also are often consumed with physical realities while we are forgetting spiritual realities. I wonder if Jesus would say some of the following things to us. You know how to recognize when your car's oil needs to be changed, but you fail to realize that I want you to build a relationship with your mechanic so you can invite them to church and he hear the gospel. I wonder if Jesus would say you, you know how to recognize when you're sick, when you're not feeling good, but you fail to realize that even in your sickness I'm trying to work in your heart. I wonder if Jesus would say, hey, you, you know how to discern what job you're supposed to take, but you fail to realize that I have put you in your workplace so that people could see Christ pictured through your life. We are just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees in that we get so consumed with the physical, we completely fail to pay any attention to the spiritual realities around us. In verse 4, we have a symbol presented. Jesus says, I won't give you any sign except the sign of Jonah. Now, what is the sign of Jonah? Jesus used this imagery just a couple of chapters ago in Matthew chapter 12, where, he says, where, where Matthew writes that some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Sounds familiar. And he answered, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Again, sounds familiar. But this time Jesus explains what he means by that. That just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the, of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You see, when Jesus says, I'll give you the sign of Jonah, he's not just giving them any old sign. He's giving them the sign, the ultimate sign, but the greatest sign of the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Son of God, that there is now gospel hope for all who would believe in him. But this is a sign that the Pharisees and the Sadducees will never believe. So Jesus and the disciples leave. They depart. They get back into the boat and they cross over again across the Sea of Galilee, putting a lot of mileage on that boat. And they're going now to, to the, they're heading to the region of Caesarea Philippi, which is another Gentile region. And in the midst of that 
that path, in the midst of that traveling, we see another conversation. A conversation between Jesus and the disciples. Verse 5 says that when the disciples reached the other side, they forgot to bring bread. Jesus said, that, just pause real quick, could you imagine what that conversation went like you can, right? Twelve guys in a boat. Hey, Thomas, you brought the bread, right? No, Peter, I thought you were supposed to bring the bread. No, no, I thought it was John. And it starts, you know, finger pointing, right? No, no, it was your job. No, your job. No, your job. Well, whoever's job it was, they forgot. Verse 6, and Jesus said to them, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Okay, so, so there's bread forgotten. There's this physical problem. But Jesus is going to use the physical problem to present a natural teaching opportunity that they would beware of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But the disciples, they're, they're not getting it. Verse 7, they began discussing it among themselves, saying, we brought no bread. Right? And they can't get off the fact that they don't have anything to eat. You know, church, we are a fickle and forgetful people. The songwriter was right when he wrote, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We, like the disciples, are so quick to forget the constant faithfulness of God when we feel the first twinge of hunger. And so for you, I remove hunger because the vast majority of us will never really feel hunger in this life. So remove hunger and, and plug in whatever trial or thing that you're facing that we are so quick to forget the constant faithfulness of God when we feel the, the first remembrance of that thing that we really wanted but couldn't have. We are so quick to forget the constant faithfulness of God at the first twinge of conflict. So quick to forget the constant faithfulness of God at the first twinge of financial struggle. So quick to forget the constant faithfulness of God at the first twinge of physical pain. Whatever it is for you, we are so like the disciples constantly forgetting God's constant faithfulness when whatever little thing comes our way. Verse 8, But Jesus, aware of this, oh, aware of their bickering, aware of their fighting, aware of their missing the point, said, O oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive, do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Jesus is saying, guys, seriously, haven't you learned? You saw me take just a couple of loaves of bread and a couple of fish and feed 5,000 men plus women and children. You, you saw me take seven loaves of bread and, and just a handful of fish and, and feed 4,000 plus 4,000 men plus women and children. You know that the provision of bread, you know that me taking care of your physical needs, you know that's not a problem for me. I have more than proven my power to be able to do that. I'm not talking about bread. But then notice that Jesus doesn't tell them what he's talking about. He tries to give the lesson. His students miss the point. He gives a corrective, no, I'm not talking about that. But then he doesn't just tell them what he was talking about. He goes back. And he says, how is it that you fail to understand that I didn't speak about bread? Okay, guys, let's try this again. Let's see if you can get this any better this time. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You have here a warning declared. A warning declared. And Jesus' warning to go back to our opening illustration is simply this. That false teaching is to your soul what dog feces would be to your stomach. And maybe you're thinking, Matt, that's gross. Yeah, but you're going to remember it. And I hope that you do. Because we've really gotten the idea that false teaching isn't that big of a deal. 
that 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 you know it's well that you know they're they're kind of using the Bible a little bit, so it's not that big of a deal. They're they're talking about Jesus, so so they can't be all bad, can they? But church, the reality is that false teaching is deadly to your soul. And we must take it seriously. Because Jesus wants us to take it seriously. And so then the disciples are admonished. Look at verse 12. Then they understood that He did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but to beware of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now I'm going to give some implications of this point, but before I do, I want to circle back and see something that Jesus said, and I want to make a a connection for you. And then after that, we'll look at at three implications for us as a church. What does it mean for us to beware of false teaching? Look back at verse 8. What is the rebuke that Jesus gives the disciples? He says, O you of little faith. But then look at verse 9. He gives him another rebuke. Uh, Do you not yet perceive? And then in verse 11, another rebuke. How is it that you fail to understand? You see, these rebukes, these are not three separate rebukes. These are, in fact, one and the same. Jesus connects a failure to understand with a failure to perceive and calls both of those a lack of faith. You see, we tend to separate the head and the heart. But Jesus never does that. I've heard this phrase said before, and I, and I understand the intent behind it, but I think it's, I think it's a little bit misleading. We, we, have you, I've heard the phrase before that, that you know, so-and-so, they missed heaven by 18 inches. That they understood it in their head, but they didn't get it in their heart. However, the Bible's not going to make that distinction. Because you see, if someone truly understood that Jesus is the most glorious and beautiful and wonderful and gracious God that we could ever hope for or imagine in our wildest dreams, so good and gracious and wonderful that while we were sinners, that he came and sacrificed himself in our place so that not by our good works, not by our baptism, not by our communion taking, not by our good merit, but simply by his grace and our faith in him, we can be saved. Like if someone actually understood that, oh, they're going to believe it. Nobody actually understands the full beauty and glory and wondrous truth of the gospel and says, I'm going to pass. Oh, there is no separation in scripture between head and heart. Even by the nature of the biblical word for it, the heart that encompasses the head, everything that we think flows right through our heart heart. Jesus will not separate head and heart. He will connect them. Our faith in Christ and our knowledge of Christ are not two separate entities. They are solidly connected. Track with me here. Look at verse 5. The disciples reached the other side. They forgot to bring bread. Jesus says, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But, but watch, watch what happens. In their mind, they forgot about the provision. They forgot about the provision of Jesus to the four and the five thousand. And so then they lose heart. They lack faith. Where are we going to get food? And then because they lose faith, they have no desire to even think about what Jesus has has said to them. No desire to understand what Jesus is saying because they lack the confidence that Jesus will take care of their needs. So they're trying to figure out, where are we going to scrounge up something to eat? And so it becomes this spiraling effect that because they're not thinking right, they're not believing right. And because they're not believing right, they're not thinking right. And then because they're they're thinking even worse, they're believing even less. And because they're believing even less, they're thinking even worse. It becomes this death spiral that Jesus has to snap them out of. You will only trust Christ so far as you know Him. Now, praise God that you don't have to have a Ph.D. in theology in order to be saved. Even faith the size of a mustard seed is sufficient to save. If all that you know of Jesus, if you've never heard anything about Jesus Christ before, and the only thing that you know of Him is that He died for your sin, He was buried, He rose again on the third day, defeating death, and all you have to do is trust Him for salvation, completely and fully trust Him for salvation. If that's all that you know of Jesus, that is sufficient. For your salvation. Praise God for that. However, 
we would understand that is an infant level knowledge and faith in Christ. That is the beginning of our knowledge and faith. And church, we are called to more than that. We are called to continue to know more and to believe more. Which is why Jesus says, watch and beware. That is why Jesus says that a failure to understand why we need to watch and beware is a lack of faith. It is instructive that in this section about knowledge and belief, it is followed up with Peter's great confession of faith. This is next week's text, but look with me in verse 13. That when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You have a knowledge of Christ. You have belief in Christ. And so then, if our knowledge of Christ is lacking, our belief in Christ will be deficient. If our knowledge of Christ is wrong, our belief in Christ will be misguided. If there are areas of our knowledge of Christ that are erroneous, then our belief in Christ will not be all that it can be. In other words, what I'm telling you, church, is that theology matters. Our doctrine matters. And we must be alert and on guard against false teaching. This is what Jesus tells his disciples. Beware, be alert, be on guard. So what does this mean for us? To be on guard against false teaching. To not just say that theology and doctrine matters, but actually to live it out as a church. To as a church be living out that we want in our people, we want in you, that you would not just be content with a surface level knowledge of the word, but that you would grow deep roots of doctrinal depth and knowledge of God and his word. I have three implications of this for us. What does it mean that this matters? Well, if theology matters, then we will have an agreed-upon statement of faith for us. Some of you may not know this, but First Grace doesn't have a statement of faith where we clearly yet concisely lay out this is what we believe about God, this is what we believe about the Bible, this is what we believe about salvation. Historically, we've simply said that you know we're a Southern Baptist church, and so we'll take the SBC doctrinal statement called the Baptist Faith and Message, and by default, that's what we believe. Yet, we'll have a constitution that has been agreed upon by over two-thirds of the church members. We'll have a document telling us this is how the church runs while not having an agreed-upon document saying this is what the church believes. You know, quite honestly, if we don't know what we believe, if we have not clearly stated this is what we believe, then does it matter? how it runs. It is a simple way that we can guard against false teaching. This is something that the elders have begun to work on, and you will see movement in. Because, and the reason for this is that Jesus tells us to beware of false teaching. And so part of being aware of false teaching is that we would clearly identify what is true teaching. The second implication of this is that if theology matters, then we need to, if theology matters, if we need to be on guard against false teaching, then the content of our music matters. And I'm going to spend some time here because the number one way in solid gospel, Bible preaching, gospel proclaiming evangelical churches, the number one way that they not only accept, but even sometimes promote false teaching is in their music or in the incredible shallow teaching that is in their music. John 4.24 says that God is spirit and those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus wants both in our worship, that we would worship in spirit, that, that, the, that the music would move us. This is the nature of our music. 
It's, it's how God designed music to work, that, that it would move us emotionally, that it would do something inside of us. We are to worship in spirit. But we are also to worship in truth that the content of our music would be true and rich and deep. Sometimes we tend to get off on a ditch. In years past, the church was, the church in general was off in the ditch of, of truth matters. But, you know, worshiping in spirit, yeah, whatever. If, if we get that, that's fine, but not a big deal. And, and so the lyrics were phenomenal. Huh. The songs, though, were hardly even singable. We are not in that ditch today as, in, as the evangelical church. Today, we're, we're not only in the ditch. <laughs> we're, we're in the ditch, up the other side of the ditch, and driving through the field on the side of all that matters is how it makes me feel. Now listen to me. How it makes you feel matters. Jesus says as much. But so does the content of our music. I've heard it said like this before. People do not leave the church humming a sermon. They leave here humming a song. And I found that to be very true, both in my own life and in the lives of those that I've walked with through various trials. When you're in the middle of a difficult trial, if you have a spiritual thought, what is that thought? I can almost guarantee you that it is not the greatest line from my sermon the previous week. Let's be honest. But there is a fair chance that it is a line from one of the songs that you were singing that week with one of your brothers or sisters. This is the power and the beauty of congregational worship. There are lines from songs that flow through our memory in the darkest of hours. Lines like that the Lord is good and faithful. He will keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus. Jesus strong and kind. Lines like what truth can calm the troubled soul. God is good. God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known in our great Redeemer's blood? Or when you're struggling and defeated and downcast in your sin, wondering how in the world could God ever love me now? Maybe it's that. One line from that great song, our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. So the first questions that we will always ask regarding our music here at this church are questions of content. The first content question goes like this. Is there even one line in this song that is either bad theology or could be easily understood to teach bad theology? reality is that there are songs that we used to sing here that we're not singing anymore, often because of just one line. There are times where we've tried to change the line to make it accurate theologically, but it just, it just never seems to flow. And so I'm going to give you an example here, and I, I really debated about sharing specific examples because I do not want to needlessly cause offense. That is certainly not my goal. However, I do think that we need more than just abstract principles. I think we need to see how this actually plays out in real life here at First Grace. So is there even one line in a song that's either theologically inaccurate or could be easily misunderstood to teach bad theology? And the example I'm going to give, just honestly speaking, it's of a song that I had never heard until I came here. And the first time I sang that song, I loved it. I'm like, how did I never hear this song before? And man, we need to sing this song all the time. It's a great song. I loved it. I love the way that the melody flowed. I, I love the, the music, the lyrics. I, I loved it. So one day, one of you, a member of the church, came up to me and said, so Matt, I was thinking about this song. I was thinking about this one line. And they said this line, and they expressed their concern. And, and there, were, there were two thoughts that I had. The first thought was, shoot, how is it that I didn't see that? Like, I'm the one who's supposed to see these things, not you. And the second one was, Oh, but I liked that song. Um, so, <laughs> so if I offend you by this one, don't worry, I offend myself by it. Um, here, here's, here's the lyrics in question. It reads like this. And the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath, till the stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. Now think about that. That's a very beautiful lyric. Rhymes, very poetic. However, that, that lyric just said that while Jesus was in the grave, everyone in heaven was going, 
I really hope this turns out okay. Really hope that this is going to end all right. Really? I don't know. Because, you see, when we talk about holding your breath, one of the ways that we will use that phrase is in the context of an uncertain outcome. Like, like when my kids are riding their bike and they're riding way too fast, I will hold my breath until they slow down because I'm afraid that they're going to huh, lose a couple of teeth maybe. All right? um, or last night, watching the Duke-North Carolina game. And I, I was, my bracket was still in it, right? I had Duke winning it all. Like, none of you picked Krzyzewski. I picked it. I was like, yes, I'm going to win, right? And, and then they started shooting free throws. <laughs> I was holding my breath because the outcome was uncertain. The morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath until the stone was moved for good. And then what? After the stone was moved, all of heaven let out a collective, whoo, <laughs> Whew, glad that turned out okay. No. Nobody in heaven was holding their breath. Everyone in heaven, everyone on earth was defeated thinking the story was over. Everyone in heaven was kicking back with a bowl of popcorn waiting for Jesus to bust out of the grave and kick death in the face. There was no breath holding. Now we do want to be careful because there are other reasons why we hold our breath to be sure. Sometimes we just hold our breath in anticipation. But this phrase can be misunderstood. It can be easily misunderstood, especially when there's a theology out there that says that God doesn't know the future. God, God is just taking it one day at a time, just like we are. And so by implication, while Jesus was in, was in the grave, everybody's just like, oh, really hope God can figure this one out. No. No, we want to be on guard against false teaching because words matter. Words matter, church. It doesn't matter how poetic the lyric or beautiful the melody. If the words aren't true, or if they can be easily misunderstood, we must set it aside. But church, we want to go beyond simply singing songs that don't teach bad theology. Like, that's not the bar, right? Oh, doesn't teach bad theology? Yes, we can sing it. No, 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 no. no. Like, the bar is a little bit higher than that. We want to sing songs that are rich and deep and teaching good theology. And one of the amazing things of the day that we are living in right now is the amount of, uh, is the number of churches in America that are craving deep, rich preaching. It is an astonishing thing that's happening in our country right now. However, we are craving deep and rich teaching from the pulpits while we are applauding incredible shallow songs from our musicians. Consider this. The book of Psalms was the hymn book of the Old Testament Jew. For that matter, it was the hymn book that Jesus sang out of. While we don't have the music, today we certainly have the lyrics. So take the beauty and the theology and the teaching and the depth of the Psalms and hold that up against our modern worship lyrics. That's a little scary, actually. If you take the top 150 songs being sung, sung right now in churches uh, across our land and hold them up against 150 psalms, it would be frightening. You know, because one of the greatest teachers of theology is the music. It is one of the greatest teachers of good theology. It is one of the greatest teachers of bad theology. And we need to recognize that the teaching that goes on extends beyond the Sunday school classroom, extends beyond the pulpit, extends beyond small group, and even goes to the lyrics of our music. Take these examples. Look at Psalm chapter 8. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You set your glory above the heavens. Or Psalm 18, I love you, O oh Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I'm saved from my enemies. Or Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Take that depth 
and richness and hold it up against some of the songs that are popular in churches today. I'll just read one section of a very popular worship song. This section goes like this. That is who you are. 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 Phrase will be saying six other times during the song and another four to eight times at the end of the song. The phrase, I worship you, will be saying 16 times in the song. And the chorus typically is saying at least six times. You know, if I did that in a sermon, if I repeated one phrase 12 times, another phrase 16 times, another, another sentence six times, and if I did that in the span of four minutes, you'd be concerned that I had a stroke or concerned that I spent more time out on the golf course than preparing my sermon. You would never let me get away with that, nor should you. And church, we shouldn't let our music get away with it either. The music teaches every bit as much as I do. So let us demand of our music that it is theologically sound, but also that it is theologically rich and deep. Why? Because Jesus tells us to be on guard against false teaching and to cling to good teaching, to rich teaching, and to deep teaching. So if Jesus wants us to be alert and on guard against false teaching, well, how else does that play out today? I mean, we don't have Pharisees or, or Sadducees that we look out for, but you better believe that there are false teachers in our world. Just because someone has a pulpit and a podcast and a publishing deal, just because they're a New York Times bestseller or they have their own regular broadcast on TBN, it doesn't mean that they're a faithful preacher of the Word. Just because they have a mega church doesn't mean that they have a Christian church. Now, lest you think that I'm just up here being bitter that I don't have a mega church, loved ones, there are some mega church pastors out there who are faithful preachers of the word, who have New York Times bestsellers and podcasts, and they are faithful. And I would encourage you, I would push you, listen to these individuals. But also be warned, there are a host of them who are false teachers. And you need to run for your life from them. And so then, church, commit yourselves to the unchanging Word of God. Be learners of this book. It's why I encourage you to go to, go to our adult Sunday school classes. It's why we've redesigned them into a modular format. Why one of those classes will always be doing some sort of theological training. Because we need to grow in our depth and knowledge of the Word. Commit yourself to regular study of the Word. Commit yourself to being here. Commit yourself to growing. Not just picking up the latest version of a Christian self-help book, but picking up resources and listening to podcasts and reading blogs, being students of the Word, so that we will not beware of the leaven of bread, but that we will be alert and on guard against false teaching. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we are so thankful that you are a God of truth. And in a day where, where we can't even define that word anymore, when we look at you, we see all that is right and true and good. And when we look at your word, we know that every word is true and every word is faithful and every word is for our flourishing and for your glory. So, Father in heaven, help us to commit ourselves to your word. Help us to commit ourselves to good teaching, to true teaching. And then as we know you, Father, would you increase our trust in you that we would not be like the disciples who so quickly forgot about your abundant provision, that we would not be like the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were consumed with the physical and couldn't see the spiritual but that we would recognize your goodness in the gospel, your faithfulness in Christ, your empowerment given to us by the Holy Spirit, that we would know you, trust you, and faithfully walk with you all of our days. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.